Last time, we left off trying to figure out Mersenne's final two laws. Let's start with the connection between the tension and frequency of a vibrating string. Unlike our length and frequency relationship, tension and frequency seem to vary directly. When tension increases, so does frequency. A reasonable guess, then, might be that tension and frequency are directly proportional. This would mean that if tension doubled, frequency would also double. However, our data quickly helps us reject this hypothesis. When our tension doubles from 1,000 to 2,000 grams, our frequency only increases by a factor of about 1.4. It doesn't double. Now, when does our frequency double? A careful look at our table shows that our frequency approximately doubles when our tension increases by a factor of four. Interesting. This could be a hint of a pattern. Let's continue our search by looking for examples of our frequency approximately tripling. Our frequency does roughly triple from 66.6 to 195.7 Hz. And notice that making this jump requires our tension to be increased by a factor of 9, from 1,000 to 9,000 grams. Now we're really getting somewhere. What mathematical relationship between tension and frequency would turn factors of 4 into 2 and factors of 9 into 3? The piece of mathematics we're looking for here is the square root. So based on this evidence, our hypothesis, our educated guess, is that the frequency of a vibrating string is proportional to the square root of its tension. We can use our guess to make specific predictions about our untested string setup. Our 40 centimeter long string, under a tension of 1000 grams, vibrates at a frequency of 99.9 hertz. Using our educated guess that the frequency of a vibrating string is proportional to the square root of its tension, we can predict that if we quadruple the string tension to 4,000 grams, our frequency should increase by a factor of the square root of 4, so a factor of 2, making our predicted frequency 199.8 Hz. Now, what about the other tensions we would like to make predictions for? Just as in our length and frequency relationship, we can make our calculation simpler by figuring out a formula instead of just a proportion. In this case, since we're claiming that frequency is proportional to the square root of tension, we can write that frequency equals some constant of proportionality k times the square root of tension. These formulas say the same exact thing, but representing our constant of proportionality explicitly as k makes our proportion easier to work with. We can now use our observation at this length to compute k, and then simply plug into our formula to make the rest of our predictions. Now that we have a set of specific predictions that we computed using our hypothesis that frequency is proportional to the square root of tension, we're ready to test. In the 40 centimeter case, for a tension of 4,000 grams, our hypothesis predicts a frequency of 199.8 Hz. And if we set our string to this tension and carefully measure our frequency, we observe approximately 191.8 vibrations per second, pretty close to our predicted frequency. And as we continue testing, we see good agreement between our observations and predictions. We have found Mersenne's second law, one more hidden connection between mathematics and the physical world. The frequency of a vibrating string is directly proportional to the square root of its tension. Now, thanks to Mersenne's clever experimental setup, he was able to confirm one more guess from Galileo about the connection between the mass and frequency of a vibrating string. If we have a quick look at our mass and frequency data from last time, we see that as our mass per unit length decreases, our frequency increases. This seems pretty reasonable. Lighter strings make higher pitched sounds. Now, how exactly does frequency increase as mass decreases? As we figured out last time, frequency also increases as length decreases, and these two quantities are inversely proportional. Frequency is equal to some constant k divided by length. Let's see if this rule fits our frequency versus mass data. This data is a little harder to work with than our last two data sets, because we don't have as much control over our experiment. We were able to choose almost any value we wanted for our string length and tension, while here the mass per unit length of our string is limited to the six different guitar strings in our experiment. This makes it highly unlikely that we will simply be able to look for examples in our data where our quantities doubled or tripled as they did before. This means that identifying patterns in our data by just looking at it is probably not going to work. 
Unfortunately, we don't have to rely on staring down our data and hoping for magical insights. Instead, we can use a little math to help us search for patterns. First, we would like to know if the same rule of inverse proportionality we used for length and frequency, frequency equals k divided by length, works for our mass and frequency data. In our previous two examples, we used our rules to make specific predictions for the experimental setups we hadn't yet observed. And if our predictions were reasonably close to our observations, that meant that our rule was probably correct. We'll apply the same exact idea here, except we'll use the rule we would like to test to make predictions about the data that we already have. If our predictions match our data, then we should have a good rule. To test our potential rule, frequency equals some constant k divided by mass per unit length, we'll compute k using one observation. And using this value of k, we'll make predictions for the rest of our observations. So, how well do our predictions match our observations? And not so well. Up until this point, our observations and predictions have been within about 5% of each other. And here, our predictions are up to 70% off. We've guessed the wrong rule. Frequency is not inversely proportional to mass. So, what should we do next? Mathematics is a pretty big topic. There's literally thousands of rules we could guess next. Well, instead of guessing randomly, let's try to be a little more systematic. While our first guess was up to 70% off, it did capture the inverse relationship between mass and frequency. As mass decreases, both our observed and predicted frequencies increase. The part of our equation responsible for this behavior is the division, so we should probably hang on to this. Now, notice that our predicted frequencies increase way more quickly than our observed frequencies. How can we modify our guess to make our predicted frequencies increase more slowly as mass decreases? Well, there are an infinite number of ways we could modify our equation, but let's start with something simple. One way to make a function grow more slowly is to take its square root. Further, square roots have already shown up twice in our mathematical exploration of the vibrating string, so this may be a reasonable guess. Now, it's not sufficient to just take the square root of all the values we've already computed. Now that we have a new guess, we need to recompute k. Before we dive in, let's make one quick simplification. The square root of k divided by m is equivalent to the square root of k divided by the square root of m. And since the square root of k is a constant just like k, we can rename the square root of k as some other constant. To keep things consistent, we'll just call this new constant k. So our new educated guess is that frequency is inversely proportional to the square root of mass per unit length. F equals k divided by the square root of m. Now that we have a new guess, let's test it. Just as before, we'll compute k using one of our observations. And using our new value of k, we'll compute our predicted frequency for our other observed cases. And our new predictions are a much better match to our observations. Our max error has dropped from 70 all the way down to 4.7%. Now, to be really sure here, we need to make predictions for our string setup we haven't tested yet. Computing k using our single observation at this length and tension, and using our new formula, we'll compute frequencies for our experimental setup. And now, making observations at these mass values, we see quite good agreement between our predictions and observations. We have found Mersenne's third and final law. Through careful experimentation and solving a few puzzles, we have discovered three very specific hidden connections between mathematics and the universe we live in. Three scientific laws. Now, after all that work, have we gained anything? Are these three discoveries just nice things to know about the world, or is there more here? Can Mersenne's laws give us any deeper insight into the mysteries we've seen so far? Remember that we began our journey with a simple question from the ancient Greek mathematician Pythagoras. Why do some combinations of vibrating strings sound good together, and others don't? And back in part two, we discovered the incredible fact that there is, of all things, a mathematical answer to this question. Strings sound good together when the ratio of their lengths is simple, and the ratio of the square roots of their tensions is simple. Now, as remarkable as this discovery is, it doesn't fully answer the question posed by Pythagoras. These mathematical relationships do a great job telling us when two strings will sound good together, but they don't really tell us why our two strings sound good together. 
Digging deeper, we followed a hunch from the 16th century Italian mathematician Giambattista Benedetti that the tone we hear from a vibrating string is a direct result of how quickly it moves back and forth, its frequency. Focusing on frequency, we then discovered Mersenne's laws, allowing us to directly mathematically link the things that Pythagoras was paying attention to, a string's length and tension, to its frequency. Now, do Mersenne's laws get us any closer to answering the question posed by Pythagoras? Why some strings sound good together and others don't? If frequency really is the right thing to pay attention to, then maybe the frequencies of strings that Pythagoras found to sound good together have something in common. We can test this idea using Mersenne's laws. We'll start with one observed frequency at a length of 60 centimeters and a tension of 4,000 grams. Then, using Mersenne's laws, we can compute the expected frequency of all other lengths and tensions in our tables. All right, for one last time, I'm turning it over to you. What frequencies do Mersenne's laws predict for the string lengths and tensions in our tables? Do the frequencies of strings that sound good together have anything in common? Can Mersenne's laws give us a better answer to the mystery of Pythagoras? Why some vibrating strings sound good together and others don't? For a closer look at these questions, check out the PDF linked below. Good luck and thanks for watching.